you got big dreams and bad jeans, you are in the right place. Bromley shirts are available at barbellapparel.com. Link is in the description. Atlas Power Shrug. The people watching know you from doing your reckless, dangerous, insulting, blasphemous lifts, shirtless in the parking lot with jeans, lowering the property values of all of the apartments around you. I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about your background because we're going to get to the odd lifting stuff. You have developed quite an impressive physique, an array of really impressive lifts, things I wish I could do. I could barely touch my toes. Um, but I wanted to start off a little bit about uh, some of the things we we're talking about recently because we were getting into it over um, this whole discussion of evidence-based training and the state of science and so on. And you actually have a bit of an educational background. So if you wouldn't mind um, just filling people in a little bit about what your experience is and um, how that kind of plays into how you see the landscape right now. Okay. Well, first off, thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this ever since ever since we kind of went back and forth on the um, odd lifts and things like that. So much appreciated. Um, let's see. As far as my background, yeah, I don't really talk about this stuff much. I prefer to just do like Chad React memes and just you know do little memes and say how you read books, you're a nerd and stuff. I I, mean, I think that's usually the correct way to um, to respond to people talking about science and just, you know, tell them post physique and stuff like that. That's usually correct. I do actually have a little bit of background, which is why I have such a negative take on science. Um, I mean, first off, my parents were both scientists. Um, my mom's a science professor and my dad's also a scientist. So I, you know, kind of came up in it and then I ended up in an experimental psychology master's program. Um, everything but thesis. And that was because I saw how bad things were. Um, I was in psych. Uh, at the time that the replication crisis hit in psychology, and that was kicked off when a guy named Daryl Bim, who was a big name, I'd seen his name in undergrad coming up, published a, a study literally purporting to show psychic powers. Like, like he, like he was literally saying that people could predict the future, and he was published. He published that in the most prestigious social psychology journal, which is a little bit strange that you can published a study on psychic powers in a scientific journal that allegedly is prestigious, right? And obviously it was just because he was a big name in the field. So that led to a lot of people going, wait, what the hell is going on here? They started trying to, there's a big effort to replicate a lot of the findings, which I was involved in. And long story short, uh, I think less than half of what we tested ended up um, getting replicated. I say we, I, I had a minor role. I was basically trying to I was kind of a lazy grad student, so I was supposed to be trying to track down one of these original researchers and actually get his data. I can say from that that he was not very forthcoming, and he seemed very shocked and surprised and offended that anyone was, was even trying to, to get his data. That's that's how rare this is in science. People think, just based on kind of the propaganda you get growing up, that you know, a scientific study gets published and, you know, then all, all the other scientists are going back and checking your work. Nonsense, nonsense. They read, they read your paper and, you know, see if they find any glaring errors. And if they don't, they're good. No one's going to look, no one's going to go back and look at your raw data. No one's observing you actually conduct the study. There's nothing to stop you from just completely making it up or, you know, any number of other things, um, you know, in, in order to get the results you want. And yes, you do have to get the results you want because they, uh, the, the way that the way academia works, you get what's called a tenure track position when you want to be a professor. You get hired conditionally for seven years to attempt to get tenure. When you have tenure, that means you're you're in. You have like very very good job security. You're pretty much squared away unless you just do something absolutely egregious. You're set for life, which means that they're very harsh on you until you get that because that's their window of opportunity to fire you. And long story short, for some reason, they've just they've set arbitrary numbers of um, publications you have to get in prestigious journals to be able to get tenure. Right. And it's there's no I mean, they're not really looking at are you a good teacher? Are you a good educator? Um, are you doing research that just isn't panning out and maybe you don't get something that gets published? No, they're looking at what is the number of publications and in, in what journals. So you're under enormous pressure to get the results that you want. I, I've seen it go south. I've seen professors not get tenure. And what that means in terms of your life is you're probably, you know, middle age now. You're, you probably have, a, if you're going to have a family, you probably have a family. People are relying on this job. Um, and suddenly after seven years, you basically get fired, right? And not only that, there's probably not that many other colleges or universities in the town where you live. So you're not going to, you're not going to be able to continue living 
in the town that you live in, if you are trying to keep a job, and um, you may not even work in the field again because obviously it's a big black mark on your record. So you're you're essentially putting a gun to someone's head and saying you need to get findings published now. And the problem with that is they don't want to publish just any research. Like if you don't if you don't get the results that you're looking for. You don't get to publish. You can't just say, hey, I had an idea. I tested it out. It doesn't work. Hey, you, now this, you know, for the rest of you guys, don't go out there and test this. I, I tried it. It doesn't work. You know, you don't publish that. You only get to you only get to publish something if you if, you know, you confirmed your own or if you failed to reject your own whatever. Uh, I'm not getting into the uh, terminology. Anyway, bottom line, you have to get the results you want to publish. So there's just a massive, massive pressure to get results, thus leading to a ton of problems. And yeah. Surprise, surprise, a lot of people are putting out studies that don't replicate. Either they're just making up data, which has happened a lot, or they're just um, they're messing around with statistics to get to make it look like their findings are significant. And I, I was actually a stats tutor in undergrad or not, sorry, in, in my master's program. I tutored um, other master's students, uh, got a lot of fairly advanced statistics. And I can tell you there are a ton of options that you have with that for messing around and getting results when there really aren't results, right? Um, especially the more the more complicated you get with those stats, I mean, you have a lot of options. So that, that probably ran on really long, but um, yeah, um, I saw I saw enough there to be very skeptical of science in general, just because of the the way that it's structured now, the pressures to produce that's bad. But then you come out of that environment where. I'll say one thing for psychology, even if a lot of the data is fake or a lot of the studies are fake, they're just making it up. Um, at least they make it look good on paper. Like, you, like they may have just not even done the experiment, just made up their data set. Right. But at least it looks good on paper. Um, like they have all they, they mostly have all the methods squared away. They're pretty good on that. It's kind of a cope. You know, they're not a hard science. So they try to they try to cope by being super rigorous on their methods. Right. Then you come in, you look at an exercise study or like a nutrition study. And you know, did you guys put a lab coat and goggles on a monkey? And, and, and they did this, like, what are you doing? You're not, you're not following even the most basic rules of science. Like anyone who had been an undergrad would know you need more than 10 people to run a T-test. You can't do that. That's like trying to run a power drill when you don't have a battery or a, you know, or, or, you know, a wall outlet, you can't do it. You know, you're not supposed to, it doesn't work. Like you're, it's, it's known to be not reliable. You know, you, if you're doing, if you're doing a test where you have the same people and you put them sequentially in two different categories, so you make them go through one condition, then make them go through another condition. You can't just do that. You have to test for order effects because there could be an effect of like, you know, doing one thing first and then one thing second. Maybe the second thing always has more or less effect, right? You know, so these are just basic things that you see every time you, I mean, every time I happen to crack an exercise study, it's trash. I, I mean, yeah, that's not even getting into the issue, which we'll probably get in. There's probably going to be reason to get into it later. Um, just as you mentioned in your video, just the, the people who sign up for, for studies, you know, like we, we talk about optimal lifting. Well, what are we optimizing? For? We're optimizing for what works for the type of people who sign up for exercise studies. I mean, you're not going to get an advanced an advanced athlete to sign up for one of these because it means you're going to have to stop doing training that works for them. I, you, you have to pay me an, an absolutely unreasonable amount of money to do one of these things, right? So anyway, bottom line, that that's yeah. Usually, I just do just dismissive chat reacts and say I don't read, but um, that's kind of my background on the exercise stuff. Sorry if that ran long. No, no, that was all uh, extremely insightful to know your uh, education, but also the the way that that kind of frames the way you look at other stuff. I mean, I dicked around in school for 10 years. I got all my, um, my, my undergraduate work. I spent a year in the kinesiology program. I dropped out of that because I thought the rigor was embarrassing. I got, I got whiplash going from science classes. I took, I was like one class away from having my associate in chemistry and then physics and astronomy. I like all the hard, like science lab classes I really gravitated towards, but then going to a four year from a junior college, I felt like I went down having gone into the kinesiology program, just from who the professors were, how they engaged with the material, the types of things they were teaching. A lot of it was just outright filler work. That was, it was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, and that was at Cal State San Bernardino, which is, as I understand it, known for their kinesiology program, specifically looking into psychology, because it is a funny dynamic, because you seem to have these two parts of that field. You have the part that seems like it would be really useful, uh, seems like it has a lot of real world application and as fuzzy as it can potentially be, whether you're dealing with, you know, 
the mental, uh, the mentally ill population, whether you're coming up with better ways to solve real problems in the real world, that has, it seems like something you could sink your teeth into. Then you have kind of pop psychology where the types of things that you're investigating seem outright ridiculous. They don't seem tethered to anything in the world that, that would tie in anything else. Like you just have a, a random field of study about being psychic. Like how does that tie into the grand theory of psychology, you know? And I went down that, that rabbit hole of, of trying to see the people that have been uh, kicked out of university for getting caught with that stuff. And the thing that grabs me about that, because you went into great depth about the incentives for getting published and getting those right results is I get some pushback from the exercise scientists because they were kind of painting a romanticized narrative about um, incentives. Well, they're not getting rich off this. People here do it because they do it because they love it. The people are, <laughs> are, you know what I mean? It's like, these are good yeah. salt to the earth, rigorous people, which in my mind is like, that's the most a scientific biased interpretation of your own field. I can oh, imagine yeah. that's, you know, that's like, no, no, trust me. These are good guys where I see the bias coming from both ends. Like if you have high financial incentives, like you're going to be the person doing Ted talks and whatever, because you ran a series of studies off shitty data, that's an incentive. But also like when rigor is low, when the stakes are not high. And I, th and I think you made the case and I tend to agree you shouldn't be allocating the same amount of money to hypertrophy studies as like cancer research. Right. So right. it's, it's the last priority, no matter how you slice it, but that just means it becomes like kind of workman, like people just getting yeah. through the day, you know, the next study you run, isn't going to be paradigm shifting, you know, it's yeah. not going to advance you. And it just, it's like office space. It just becomes like, Oh, did you finish your TPS reports? Oh, did you get that study? Exactly. published? And I mean, I know how I am and I know how other people are. I think the default status for human beings is when they're up against it to just kind of get the work in. And yeah. I can just really easy see, easily see how this, this seeps into the field uh, to its detriment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just at a certain point, if you don't have the resources, you can't do the study. And that that's kind of that that's where a, a lot of I, I think that's that's kind of the issue with the mentality of exercise scientists. It's just I think they come up in a culture where we have limited resources, so we're just going to do what we can. But it's like, I mean, the equivalent of what they're doing, they always want to say, like, oh, it's still the best tool we have available. It's like. I mean, I, I think a good analogy is like, let's say a diesel truck. A diesel truck is always going to be a better transportation option than a horse, right? Unless you don't have diesel. Um, if you have no fuel, if you don't have oil, you know, if you don't have the resources necessary to run a diesel truck, then you might as well go get a horse, even though a diesel truck can obviously haul things a lot better. Well, a horse can eat grass, so that may be all you have available. And I mean, you could, you can, theor I mean, you can think of in theory an exercise science that would be, you know, the best option we have available for figuring things out. It's just the question of, I think people wildly underestimate the amount of resources you need because it would be, I mean, it would be real. We're still talking about dealing with the human body and which is very, obviously a very complicated thing. And, you know, it, it's really not any less complicated than medicine. You know, exercise science would not be any, any less complicated than medicine, but obviously we're not talking about saving someone's life. We're just talking about what helps you grow your biceps bigger. So, I mean, let, until we've solved a lot of other world, real, you know, real world problems, like does it really make sense to allocate the inordinate amount of resources we'd need to actually like really at that like granular level, understand how to build biceps better, or should we just make it you know, a craft, you know, um, you know, have craftsmen who just know their craft and have you know, real world experience. Maybe they don't know with the level of, you know, exactitude that you might, um, you might get through that fully developed exercise science, but you get pretty close and, you know, without just that ridiculous amount of, um, of work, it's kind of like, I mean, for, for viewers who don't know the difference between an algorithm and a heuristic, an algorithm is kind of, is like a, a method of solving a problem that, that if you put in all the, um, all the correct inputs, it will always give you the exact right answer. Um, it's like a math problem. You know, you, you give it the right inputs, it's going to spit out the right answer, right? The problem is you don't always know all those inputs and the algorithm ends up being basically useless if you don't, it, like, if you can't fill in all those variables or if you get some of them wrong, then the answer might be completely off and or it just might not give you an answer, right? Whereas a heuristic is something that um, is a little bit faster and looser. It, it works with less information. It's not always right, but it's usually pretty close. And like you have to learn to use heuristic reasoning, you know, when you don't have the resources to like run the whole thing to get the exact right answer. You know, I think people are just kind of not not realizing the limitations there. You know, 
Yeah, you made a statement in one of your videos recently when you were talking about um, talking about all of this. You made a, a comment that you think people should um, engage with problems at the level that you can observe them. Mm -hmm. And I think about this stuff because it seems different in some fields. Like you have stuff that's very top down, which is like looking at complex systems where you can only kind of engage in pattern recognition and use heuristics mm -hmm. because that's the only way you can engage with it. You can't exactly. start granularly and build your way up. Whereas um, something like the physics or chemistry, as you would think of it, mm -hmm. excuse me, um, you're, you're looking at the fundamental parts, but everything is so tightly wound together that once you count enough of those things, you can put them together. And then, you know, that you can punch into the algorithm, you make the machine, it works mm -hmm. 10 out of 10 times. And when I point out those differences, it's like the, the pushback seems kind of insane, almost knee-jerk emotional reaction to imply that there's different ways of attacking problems based on mm -hmm. what you have to do, given the information you have. And when you compound that with the fact that it feels like in those other fields, nobody's trying to force answers or recommendations on things that aren't quite settled yet. Whereas mm -hmm. in these fields, we have all of the, it's like, we still in medical science, we still have to have something to give people. We still have to have a method or something, but it's on the backbone of all the things we don't know. And it's like the race is to figure out what we don't know. So I always end up just really kind of, if I'm black pilled on exercise science, I think it's really because I don't hear people enough talk about what we don't know. What would be those things that would give us an algorithm instead of a heuristic? And I don't know if people think it's a frivolous question because it's ever going to happen. I don't know if they don't know to ask the question, but I have to fundamentally think that if you're going to use exercise science to push forward a field, you have to get to the point where you've answered enough of those questions where you're not just dealing in single variables in a vacuum. Yeah, because, exactly. Because the heuristic at that point is infinitely better than than what the opposite is and anyways that's my frustration with it oh yeah 100 percent. i mean people want to get i mean I, I get why they're doing it because they want to get causal they want to get they want to get to that algorithmic level oh this is the thing that's doing it but i mean you have to you have to know the whole picture if you you can't just go in there and get like a snapshot oh this is one hormone this is one neurotransmitter you know that's act that's doing this at this time but there's you know so many other factors if you don't know those, those other factors at that level yeah it's useless um so it's much better just to know hey big guy like all all these big guys say if you do this your biceps grow so maybe that's better like honestly like my idea of how we should do exercise science if we were going to do exercise science is almost treated more like instead of in, you know instead of trying to get to that level just like use just use data analysis to try to kind of organize the anecdotes of big dudes like you know what like let's just let's just um you know, find out what percent of big dudes say, you know, this is valuable, this isn't, you know, just try to actually use, you know, data analysis on the, you know, on what, you know, people who are doing it have, you know, found out and just trying to, you know, present that in an organized manner. So we're not trying to get down at that mechanistic level that is, you know, so hard to do without enormous amounts of resources. Um, and just, you know, kind of organizing the anecdotes that we have. I think that might be a more useful way to do it. But well, given that we have, I mean, we have apps, right? Everybody can log their workouts. If you could have Google or some similarly sized company that's masterful at that, you would think mm -hmm. that eventually you could get enough meaningful data that you could probably extrapolate some trends that would be mm -hmm. surprising if you had enough people that were diligently logging all of their information as they went. But I, when I think far into the future, I mean, this is how pessimistic I am about the field because lifting to kind of get your body to accidentally hold more tissue is kind of a dumb thing, right? It's like neat that it happens this way, but you think when we're so advanced that there might be other ways of manipulating the human body that are more predictable. So it's like we have something where you're going to grow anyways, because that's just what the human body does. And then eventually you're going to stop growing and you have to do something else. And then in the meantime, we have all these question marks about, about what's going to happen. And I mean, shit, you mentioned the term optimal, even that kind of boils my blood because it's like, what does that even mean? Are we talking about yeah. what's going to give you the most gains today? How important is that for what's going to continue growing you long-term? How important is that for, um, when you get stagnant, what does that even mean? If you take into account all of the other variables that anyways, it's like, we could go on and on and on, but the, yeah. the whole epistemic problem is just like, it's grading paired with the emotional reaction where people seem to be really connected ideologically to what it means to be an evidence-based uh, coach. Yeah. Or I mean, that, that really is it. It's the, it, it's, it's such a strong emotional connection. It's, 
I mean, it is, it, you know, it's almost at this point, it's like, um, you know, it, it, it's very, it, it almost feels cringe to say it like you're like a creationist or something, but like they really are kind of treating science as almost a religion in certain ways. And they have, they have a, you know, this emotional reaction to it. They, um, they have this emotional bond to it and they're like, this is something that we're putting up on a pedestal and we're like venerating it. We're not, I mean, there, there's really no like sign like the principles are just completely absent but there's a strong emotional attachment to the trappings you know it's like yeah. people um a great example is all this talk of genetics um now i mean we know that genetics are very important we know that but i what i mean can we actually observe that in the level that we're talking about it now you know everyone everyone talks about their genetics everyone says what their genetics for muscle building are and you know no one's had a dna test no one has actually directly observed their genes there's making a guess you know um now obviously some things like you know limb lengths and, and whatnot are probably genetic but that's not what people are talking about they're saying like this particular muscle like i i can't put on as much muscle as that guy because my genetics are different okay did you talk to a geneticist did you get a dna test no we're just dressing it up um with, you know with scientism we're using terminology it's it's almost like you've heard of um you've heard of uh the cargo cult thing right so which one the cargo cult uh phenomenon no Oh, that, this, it's the perfect metaphor. It's, um, so I guess in some Pacific Island in World War II, we, we had an air base on some, some island and they had like basically hunter gatherers living there at the time, but we needed the air base to go bomb the Japanese or whatever. So anyway, um, we would fly in, you know, planes to the airstrip, drop off cargo, whatever. I think we probably gave some to the natives and whatnot. And they're, they're observing this the whole time. And I think they're, you know, they're probably getting some handouts and observing this. So then war ends, we leave and they construct like mud and stick facsimiles of like an air, of like an air tower. And they like, they, they do the air traffic controller thing with sticks, hoping to, um, hoping to get the, the gods to send down yes. more cargo. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, that's what I see when I see like science-based people, you know, talking about this stuff. There's like genetics, the way people talk about genetics, they might as well be saying a wizard did it, you know, <laughs> like you have no idea what, you know, that. To, we're just using all these terms that we don't you know, really understand at that level. Yeah. And to get that, that point across, because even like, I hesitate to use terms that we are even using right now, because I think they've gotten so tainted and they do incite that feeling in people probably since COVID where you had this argument, you know, know existing you on a much, much larger level. But when people talk about the science or science, it's like, even that is something where somebody associates very deeply. It's kind of bizarre that human beings can basically engage in telepathy and like, you can know exactly what I'm thinking based off these few sounds I make. But at the same time, like very simple ideas go way over our head because of how vague and open-ended the words we use are. And even in having this discussion, like God, in the comments, I made a statement like, hey, we built pyramids before we had colleges. And somebody's like, the pyramids weren't built using science. And it's like, you have to get to the point where you clarify every single point you make. Are you talking about a systematic search for truth given an objective physical reality? Or are we talking about guys in lab coats doing research, you know, to to make their uh, make their money? And then that goes back to that goes back to optimal, right? It's like, what does optimal even mean? And you have this breakdown of of all of these words. So when I'm talking about the science, it's like, I have to be very clear, like, yes, there is an objective reality. Yes. There is a systematic method of knowing better what works and what doesn't, but no, it's not necessarily going to be in that academic department for every, right. for every field. Fields are different. They have different fundings. They have different problems. They have to solve. They have different holes. Maybe one day they will, but the problem is right now they don't, and they're trying to make recommendations around it. So the, the, the religious thing, it, it's really apt, but also I hesitate to engage in that because it, um, I don't know, it's triggering, right? And it's, it's like the, the kind of dismissiveness and, and it, it's, it's true. It, it actually is, I think the same part of your brain that might make somebody inclined to, to kind of follow it, whether it's political identity or, or religion or what other belief they have. But, um, it's it's the it's the overall sense that you kind of know how things should be because science good i have technology and i have heating in my house and these amenities and i have you know the 10 times types of caffeine to keep me going whereas you know the superstition and bro science is bad but it, it goes so much deeper than that because that doesn't tell you how you make recommendations 
when you don't have all the answers and how to hedge those bets. And that becomes a very unintuitive thing. And the whole conversation just breaks down uh, very quickly. And it does, it just evolves into, I think people's knee jerk reactions of I'm going to follow this guy. Cause I like the cut of his jib. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it's, that's essentially what it does break down to. Cause I mean, essentially you're at the level of like, I mean, not, not the harp on the religious thing, but we're kind of, we're kind of at the level where, you know, medieval Europe was where you have priests that are, you know, speaking that are, you know, giving sermons in a language that the common folk don't even understand. Yeah. And they're having to make decisions based on that. It's, I mean, if you don't, if you don't have that like personal experience, personal understanding of how science actually works, I mean, you have people basically just um, telling you magic words that you don't actually have any, any way to contextualize and interpret. So you're, I mean, you think, I mean, you, you've just been taught that science gives you truth. So you, you know, when people say the right magic words, you tend to believe them, but if you don't actually have, I mean, they might as well just be talking about, you know, the same angels and demons and wizards and witches and, and whatnot that they were back in the Middle Ages, because at the end of the day, if someone doesn't actually understand how this stuff's supposed to work. I mean, there, it, it is it is kind of just based on faith. Like, I don't, I, you know, if you don't understand how this, if you don't understand the statistics they're using, you're just assuming that what they're doing is right. If you don't understand how the methods are supposed to work, you just, you know, they use the right, you know, magic words and you assume they're a wizard. But I mean, yeah, man, that that really I like I like to talk about wizards and sorcery because they might as well just be talking about magic because you you don't know. There's a weird um there's a weird uh dynamic too because there's it feels like there's the people that are all in on training and they feel like they have such a good sense of it and a lot of intuition and that a lot of it, some of it might not be exactly what they think it is, but there's a lot of good general useful intuition. But then on the other hand, you get people that are all in on the science, but are completely blocked off from training. And it's funny to see where that gap is in the middle, because a lot of the comments I've sifted through and responses I've gotten have been on people that are been from people that are firmly on one side of the fence. So it is funny to see the, the dismissiveness of people that are just bro science. But when you see the academics that uh, they do know thoroughly how science uh, formally is supposed to go down. But then there's this other thing that they're missing, which is, well, what is training? How do we grow? What are all the relevant things that you have to keep track of to know that this is going to go the way you think of? So it's like, yeah, there's all the words you don't understand, the specific biological processes, this black box of genes and of all of these, um, you know, the, these metabolic processes that and feedback loops that we have no idea, you know, what leads to what. But then on the other hand, it's like, I, I mean, I've gotten lectured by uh, by people that are obviously active in the field that are so ready to comment on behalf of the the discipline that they're not directly a part of without having any understanding of like the actual training that's required and how many pieces of information are missing based on this one variable. Like, yeah, you can't know anything about volume if you don't know literally everything else that went into that training program, because it's all tied together. Uh, genetics, like you said, it's a ghost in the machine. Everybody loves to reference genetics. What genetics? We can count genetics. We know we know how to identify genetics. Tell me which ones. But it's a catch. You know, Dorian Yates was right. saying in one interview that he's like, "Well, my genetics weren't as good as so and so." Everybody thinks they have shit genetics, um, and it's, it's just an interesting dynamic. So I want to ask you, like, what you, uh, what hope do you have, if you have any, for the field or for science communication in general? I know you just put up that Menno study, and there were some interesting comments that kind of suggested it went over a lot of other people's heads. Is there even a point to trying to get the general public to engage with this stuff, given how low the rigor kind of seems to be, not just from the academic side, but in what we expect of the average person to even be able to get right when they listen to somebody in good faith. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm pretty black gold on that. I, yeah, I mean, you, well, I don't know. The, the only, the only, it's not, it's not that positive. It's just the only the only light of hope in, in regards to that is that increasing numbers of people are just distrusting science in general for other reasons that I'm not going to go into because I don't want to get you demonetized or anything. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of distrust out there. So people are becoming increasingly skeptical. But I mean, the thing is, like, you know, you can if you don't if you don't really understand how science is supposed to work. I mean, how are you supposed to critique it? And if even if the guy doesn't know that much about how to train, he can always just take a bunch of gear and get big anyway. I mean, I, I you're not supposed to say that, but it's totally true. I mean, at least not not when it comes to necessarily performance that you got to know what you're doing to get good performance in general. But I mean, yeah, you can do you can do science based workouts, and if you blast enough gear, you'll probably get big. <laughs> you know, 
Um, so, so how, so, you know, how is, how is this person who doesn't really know how science is supposed to work, supposed to look at this guy who's very large and say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but, you know, that's kind of, the I, I mean, ask, I mean, ask, you know, I think, uh, and, and the thing is even, even people that do know from that, from, from, um, from those particular fields, they're, they're in this culture where that sort of thing, where the lack of rigor is completely acceptable and where you're, you're kind of just drinking the Kool-Aid and thinking this is how science is supposed to work. I mean. The, the question is, you know, you bring you bring hard scientists in like, you know, chemists, physicists, certain types of biologists in, have them look at the stuff, you know, see what they think of it, see if they think it's rigorous, see if they would put any trust in it. That's kind of the real test. But the average person can't do that. So, yeah, I'm, I don't have that much hope. I mean, I think the best we can do is just try to communicate this better because they, I mean, I will say in, in the defense of the benighted layperson, I mean, there haven't been that many people talking about this like we do. It has been mostly just bro saying, oh, yeah science is bad you know and that's not that hasn't been i mean that this this side hasn't been presented as well as it could be so hopefully with that um with more of that you know there's some hope but yeah yeah i I worry a little bit about the pendulum swinging because um it seems to be very reactive and it's like it only finds the middle accidentally on its way to the other side because the skepticism is like warranted given the problems but then it's like the inevitable overreaction is uh, a lot of kooky conclusions on the other end that are dismissive of, you know, hundreds of years of progress. And it's like, you're screwed either way with this. It's like, I have to be so clear with people because if you argue one side, they put you on the other side. If I'm skeptical of what's going on with what the PhDs are doing, I must be anti-science. And it's, I have to say like, no science is important, but that's why skepticism is important and holding people accountable for their outcomes is important. Cause I do worry that, me yelling so loud, given the way I've seen people misinterpret just about everything that happens online, that it's like the people that do glob on do end up going, uh, going too far in one direction and, and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that just, it begs a question of how you even have this conversation with social media, the way it is. I mean, we can talk about how, uh, the fitness industry is full of bullshit and charlatans or whatever, but I don't think enough people really put it at the feet of the lay person because I think we've come to kind of expect that they're going to be like, like cognitively delayed children. And we've just expected that they're not going to be able, or that they're not supposed to engage with anything that much, but like in that menno study, you, you, you used, I mean, it was a, it was a crappy study, 10 people, it was about sleep and you posted it to show how something that was so, empty as far as having any substance to it was um, being portrayed as like another nail in the coffin or proof of something or whatever. And it seemed like half the people thought you were taking a shot at sleep or, you know what I mean? It, and, yeah. I, and I got the same thing. It's like, if I respond to somebody that makes a hit claim about high intensity training, it's just nonsensical. Then I get a paragraph about why hit works for them. And I'm like, I never said it didn't work. I've used it. Like, like, yeah. like, what do you talk? Like anyway, so I, I do throw a lot of it at the feet of the people that are viewing because it just seems to be getting worse as social media gets, yeah. gets better. But yeah, it, it is a very haunting thought of forget about what we even do with the science. It's like, how do you even adequately relay something so complex and nuanced to the general public? It almost makes me think like, maybe we shouldn't try. And uh, and then I don't know. That's. Yeah. Well, I mean, all we can do is try. We, um, and I mean, I think I, I do think that there has been kind of a uh, there's been a lack of that. There's been a lack of people that have the educational background pushing back on it because I mean, all the incentive is let me just you know use the new science as a credential that can get me status to you know sell my product, sell my yes. uh, macro tracking app that is that you know I'm conveniently never going to actually tell you the research that backs this, but I'm going to tell you why nothing else works. According to science, oh yeah, none, none, none of those stuff works. So, by the way, buy my app, right? Um, you know, so you know, there's there's an incentive for people to you know put science on a pedestal because it's a it's a source of um, authority that lets you you know sell a product. And there hasn't there's there's really no incentive to talk about why. Okay, actually, the science you're talking about is even isn't even really following the actual principles of science. So, yeah, I, th- I think if if we um, yeah, I think if people like us put more of that out there. I think people will listen. I think a lot of them will understand, you know, the, 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 the one thing that I, that I think about a lot in terms of how you communicate with folks is like, I'm not trying to save people that are not, um, it's not a lot of hope for, I kind of look at it kind of like a triage situation. You, you respond, you respond to a mass casualty incident. You don't necessarily treat the most seriously wounded people first. 
because a lot of them are probably going to die anyway. You try to think, you try to like go for the people that you're confident you can help, but seriously need help. And you go for those, the people that are pretty good. You, you leave them be for now. The people that are probably going to die anyway, you don't waste your time on you, you know, try to go for the people that you know, you can help. So I, I don't put much effort into trying to help the people that, um, that there's probably not that much hope for anyway. And, you know, there's, we can't focus on them, but, um, I think there is there are a lot of people in the middle who you know could understand this and are you know, worth talking to and they like a lot a lot I, th- I feel like about a lot of those people they're not getting enough direct with them because everybody's so worried about the beginner that you just need to tell hey man you got to be consistent you got to make sure you go to the gym every week did you know that you're not going to get any gains if you program pop every every week and you don't go to the gym yeah man you have to keep doing it for years yeah you, you know if a guy needs to be told that every day, you, you can't help him anyway. He's, yeah. he's, he's not, he's not going to make it. I'm sorry. You know, I'm more interested in the people who are going to be, who are going to do the basics. They're like, they don't need to be told, Hey, you have to go to the gym regularly. I'm more interested in the people that, you know, have more capability to be helped. And I think they're kind of underserved because everyone's trying to, you know, dumb things down to sell programs to the lowest common denominator and just reach the largest audience. But I think there are a lot of people out there that, you know, totally can't understand this stuff. It's presented to them well. I would recommend strongly anybody listening to this. Uh, if you haven't followed Data Driven Strength, I feel like they're pretty good with this. And I actually am meaning to do a response to a video they did recently with uh, Greg Knuckles about effective reps. And, and it's funny you say that because I feel like the dissent is out there. It just doesn't like coalesce because I don't know if people uh, just don't want to be confrontational in the moment or if they don't mm-hmm. actually seek it out. I mean, you get the fringe people that are overly confrontational. We know who those are, but in the field, generally, it seems like people aren't super eager to like name names if they see somebody acting out of line, but that specific podcast, it was so fascinating to listen to because you don't see it anywhere else when people are saying, you know, Hey, this is the best thing we have to inform our training. And then you listen to, you know, knuckles and these guys with data driven strength. And it was like three hours of just, like a scientist, like a physicist would just hypothesize about what's next, given all the things we don't know. But to get there, you have to acknowledge all the things that we don't know and to listen to them candidly. I mean, the data driven strength guys, you hear the angst in their voice when they're talking about the numbers because they're aware of the confounding variables. They're like, God, it sounds like this isn't great, but this is the best we could do. And uh, mm-hmm. Knuckles, Knuckles himself talked about, you know, the black box of like all of these feedback loops we don't know. Like, you know, it's like, we don't actually know like everything about mechanoreceptors. We don't actually know about all of these things that trigger these feedback loops. And we're making very broad connections. And and it was fascinating to listen to because that's absent when somebody is like, oh, this is my app. This is my program. I have the PhD. I'm the evidence-based guy. Here's my program. I wrote it. It's evidence-based, even though it's going to look different than a program from 30 different other evidence-based guys. Um, so I, I think it's out there. And I don't know if it's just a matter of like getting those people in the same room and pressing them to see where that line in the sand is. But yeah, mm-hmm. there, I feel like there just has to be something checking it because I know myself, I don't care about the field figuring it out. All fields have to do that. I just strongly have a problem with the consumerist relationship that incentivizes having answers in a very firm manner that you are not justified in having just given yeah. all of the things that that you don't know. Um, I want to segue from that because I feel like we, we covered that pretty thoroughly. Um, Mm -hmm. but you mentioned beginners and that's kind of a nice segue. Um, another problem I have is people orienting what's in the sphere based around lifters being like scared deer, where if you give them the wrong information or too much criticism or expectation, they'll run away and they won't participate in your, in your lifting club. And that's the worst thing ever. Um, that was something I heard. I I think when I was getting into it with barbell medicine a bit over like lower back stuff, not that I ever got into it with them, but the, that type of debate, because they're focused a lot on beginners, like not scaring them away by telling them, uh, you know, you should try to deadlift with your back straight or whatever. And then that made me think of deadlifting, not with your back straight, which is what you're absolutely an expert at. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, about your, uh, odd lift stuff. Um, specifically kind of how you got into it and how that became kind of a staple in, in your training where you've taken it this far. Okay. Well, um, how, how did I get into it? Um, I mean, for a long time, I was kind of doing the same stuff everybody else is, which is essentially 
training to be a power lifter without actually thinking of yourself as a power lifter and competing in power lifting. I did once just to uh, back one of my buddies, he incredibly gifted squatter. Um, but that, that one meet anyway. Um, but yeah, I was training like a power lifter, even though I wasn't a power lifter, which in retrospect was stupid, but I didn't know it at the time. And so like many other people, I got to a certain point, yeah, fairly decent, you know, um, 500 back squat, uh, 385 touch and go bench, um, 600 deadlift to 240 overhead press, but I was, I was pretty fat at the time. So I, as soon as I got down, obviously I lost all that, but, um, anyway, not, not the, not the deadlift, but the overhead press. I mean, anyway, um, but you know, I just kind of stagnated. And then the thing that I guess you already named, but I, I always just say the thing that we can't name because it makes the government look bad because of their response. And, yeah. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. That thing happened. So the gyms shut down. So I had to lift at home. I happen to have, um, a barbell and I quickly got some plates, but you know, all I had was you know a barbell and a couple plates. So, you know, not, you can't really train like a power lifter when you have that set up. Um, I'd already known about, uh, the bronze and silver eras. I've done a lot of reading about their stuff. Um, I don't, one of the best, I mean, I've read some books on it. Uh, muscle smoke and mirrors is a really interesting read just for the history. Um, it, there's a blog called, the Tillo two uh, dot blogspot that just has a ton of old articles from those eras. And I've done a lot of reading. So I, I kind of knew that, you know, the old timers had done a lot of different stuff and they'd done it with not the same level of equipment that we have today. I, I never really, you know, dug deep into it, but I knew it was there. I'd done, you know, I'd done some Zercher squats. I'd done some one hand deadlifts, but nothing super technical. But then when, you know, the opportunity to just go in there and max out on your, De- or, you know, do a heavy deadlift, do a heavy bench press, do a heavy squat was taken away from me. You know, I kind of knew, I-, I knew an avenue I could go down. So I started doing it and lo and behold, it started working well. I started making progress. I started making gains, both physically, like, you know, you know visually and also um, just in terms of what I could do. Uh, you know, that led, that led me to realize, oh, wow, there's, there's a lot of stuff that um, I could really do. I started, you know, actually trying some of the stuff that I'd read about, but never, uh, you know, never actually thought to do before, like bent presses. You know what the bent press is, right? Yeah, yeah. You you push yourself away from the yeah, it's barbell. insane lift. I mean, they a, a lot of the old timers were doing three hundred pounds overhead with one hand that way. You know, the numbers that elite strongmen are doing on um, you know, on the uh, circus dumbbell, they were you know guys who were like two hundred pounds were doing, and in, I mean, in one case, I, I mean, Saxon did. I mean, the, the, no one, even the the super heavyweights are putting 370 pounds overhead today and you know saxon weighed like 205 so it's i heard there was some uh, some contention around that lift i hear not everybody think it thinks it was legit that that one i've never heard any any debate over that i I think i think think there was a lawsuit i can't remember if oh no no, if it was sandow or if it was somebody else no 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 saxon uh, got in the lawsuit with sandow but it wasn't over that lift no one um no one disputed that lift saxon i mean some not all these guys have good reputations but saxon had a about one of the best reputations of any of the guys. He actually, um, his policy was he's always going to try to undersell his lifts because that way, if anyone tries to challenge him on it, he he's ready to. It's not his it's not his true max, and he can um you know, he he can rise to the challenge at any time. Now, th- th- as far as the uh, the bent press record, that was that was done in front of a reputable judge. I mean, they, they still had judges back then. They would actually. If they were going to do an official record, they would do it in front of like an accredited judge with their organizations and whatnot. But no, his his lawsuit was with uh, Sandow because uh, I think Sandow was one of the pioneers of the bent press, and he I mean he, he got up to like two eighty, which is pretty cool for a like, probably what one hundred eighty pound guy, you know, lifting two eighty overhead with one hand or something. But then Saxon came along and just smoked him, and rather than being a good sport and saying, um, you know, wow, this guy, look, this guy's taking this and running with it. You know, he he challenged um, Saxon and ended up losing the competition, and then tried to sue. Uh, you know, Saxon, of course, was happy to gloat that he <laughs> beat that. You know, he beat Sandow, and you know, um, uh, Sandow sued him over this claim. Uh, what it, what it ended up being, uh, I think. Uh, uh, like Saxon had a challenge, dumbbell or barbell or whatever the case may be, and he he was able to bent press it, challenge Sandow to do the same. Sandow actually got to, got down to the lockout position at the bottom, but he couldn't stand all the way up with it. So what the the, the ground the base of the lawsuit was, Sa- Sa- uh, Saxon was basically claiming that Sandow couldn't lift the weight. Sandow claimed legally that um, he lifted it because 
he got his lot. He, he got his arm straight, even though he didn't stand up with it. Mm. Anyway, either way, Sand- yeah. Sandow was not necessarily a great person, great athlete, but not a great person. Um, but yeah, no, no, that that's fully legit. Um, some other stuff like Charles Rigolo, I believe I'm pronouncing that right, French. I could be butchering it. And his um, 253 pound one hand snatch. That one, that one, we know we. Uh, like crystal clear we know that one's legit um so a lot of these crazy um feats were you know done in front of audiences judges weight plates i mean maybe they, they didn't weigh them quite as well as we could today but they were weighing them you know um so you know we know it's more or less how did i get on that yeah any, anyway so it, yeah anyway i started doing stuff like that um found out you know there's actually a lot of good in it um and just kept kept exploring it but i mean my my thing with that has always been like i'm looking to find tools to develop from so i'm you know i've kind of tried a lot of it and incorporated what works much more so or you know what's what's actually leading like lasting um you know strength benefits of carryover to other things or just you know size benefits what what have you i'm I'm kind of looking at all this through the lens of like what's going to help me develop what's going to carry over you know if i can do if i can do a cool feat that's fun that's great but if i can do something that's going to build strength that's going to carry over to other things you know maybe i'm not practicing something for half a year and then i come back at it instead of pr because of something else i've been working on that's kind of what i'm going for you know i, don't, I get a lot of that surprisingly uh, surprisingly often I just get kind of the no practice PRs because a lot of this stuff just builds so well. Did you, um, first of all, I'm gonna have to make a note to go look over that Saxon number because I'm going to reserve the right to be a bit skeptical on that one. Having specialized in overhead for a long time. I know that bent, bent press a different animal, but that's, uh, I, I know a lot of people like will cite, uh, will cite, um, Gorner's numbers with his deadlift, not recognizing that, um, there were differences about the setups, you know, pulling from blocks or not lifting it all the way to lockout or so on. They were kind of par for the course, but, well, uh, with, that, with, with Gorner, I, I just want to clear up the air on that. Like with Gorner, the, the one that gets, that gets thrown around is he did a supposedly did a one hand deadlift of 729 pounds. I believe yeah. that one there's, a, there's debate. I've seen it listed as a revolving barbell, but there's a lot of debate on that. But what people don't, what people don't, don't get with that is that whether, whether 730 is a miss, um, is maybe some mistakes of what the um, what the implement was. He did 660 in on a on a revol- revolving barbell weight weights in front of a judge. So 660 is still a fairly good one hand yeah. deadlift. I think most people would say. So 660 is set in stone. I've, I've seen uh, that did that. I've seen over 800 cited a few times as like a a, a two hand deadlift. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. My understanding is he never really tried to max out on it because he was yeah. so far from ahead of the competition anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he didn't really bother with yeah. two hand with maxing out on two hand deadlifts. But I mean, if we know he did like 660 one handed, I mean, sure. probably 800 is not that unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's a lot to consider. I'm just, I'm going to make a little star to go back and look at that Saxon lift because that's, uh, I have some questions for some of the pros that are out right now. If, if that's the, if that's the number uh, that existed from back then, but I want to, I don't want to dwell on that. I want to um, dig into uh, this stuff because you see a lot of, a lot of, let's say unconventional lifting, especially since social media mm-hmm. incentivize it to a degree. I may have commented on that in the past. Uh, and, I think you did. <laughs> and um, you stand out a bit to me because it seems like there's a few camps of people you'll have like strong men, like Martins Lisa is a good example. He's just a well-rounded strong man and strong as shit. Mm-hmm. And because he's not the stiff block of wood, like most of them are, he has the flexibility to go and like do a Steinborn lift or whatever mm-hmm. without it being central to his training. And then on the other hand, you'll have people that kind of live and breathe the odd lift stuff, but seem to get like way out there. You mentioned that you kind of started out powerlifting, but there seems to be like a thread of very, um, I would say productive, useful, size uh or sorry a, a productive and useful quality of these movements that you do that yield size and strength um as opposed to what you kind of see in some of these uh some of these channels where it's like just trying to lift things the oddest way you can uh to, to look good on camera so i'm curious if you see what you do in, in like its own thing do you have a way of thinking about it a label or is it just you like to go out and do what's interesting to you do you feel like a kinship with the other people because they are doing unconventional stuff or do you kind of see what you're doing as its own thing um it's 
Yeah, I mean, there are definitely different different ways of approaching this. And I mean, like a lot of people are, um, I mean, a lot of people are just are purely just doing that sort of thing for fun. I mean, if you're um, if you're just trying to see how many different implements you can um, you can combine together in one lift just for the hell of it. You're probably not, you know, thinking there's going to be a ton of developmental benefit to that. Sure. And, you know, you whether you're doing it for your own personal fun or whether you're doing it for, you know, Instagram, like, I think there's with a lot of that stuff, there's not that much. Um, there's not really the assumption that it's that much of a developmental tool. Um, as far as like separating what I do from what they do. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it from kind of a perspective. I'm, I'm looking for, obviously I like to do fun stuff. I like to, you know, show off occasionally, but I'm also looking for, um, for tools that work, you know? So I, like one of the ways I think about it with some of the stuff is like, I think about it as I have kind of a large uh, research and development budget. I'm happy to go down rabbit holes that may turn out to be unproductive. Um, just exploring lifts, exploring, you know, trying out new things, trying out old things. And in a lot of cases, seeing if it goes anywhere, because I've had so many cases where something that looked just like, Oh yeah, I'm just, that looks wacky. I'm going to do it. Oh wow. That turns out to be really useful. Like a great example is the, um, the Kelly snatch, which is basically a behind the back snatch. Um, that one just, it looks so weird. It looks so bizarre. Um, you, you wouldn't think there'd be any use to it. I just tried it out for novelty, but then lo and behold, I found out it was incredible for shoulder health. And I, it really? got to the point where I was, I was not doing, I couldn't do my press. Now I had other unaddressed issues that were causing this, but I couldn't do my press workouts without warming up with Kelly snatch. Wow. I mean, because what you, what it ends up being is, I mean, you're getting, you're getting a great weighted stretch on that bicep tendon and you know, the issue I was dealing with was bicep tendonitis. It's super common, the, you know, bicep tendonitis at the shoulder. So you're getting a weighted, you're getting a weighted stretch on that tendon. At the same time, you're, you're working your rear delts, um, Terry's majors and stuff, uh, you know, whatever. You're working a lot of stuff back there, um, getting some stability in a position you're not usually in. And I mean, I don't have any kind of scientific way of explaining this. I don't think there have been a whole lot of studies done on the Kelly snatch, but it feels like something where the sum is a little bit more than its parts. I mean, you could just do rear delt work. You could just do, um, you know, by, you know, uh, incline curls or some other sort of bicep stretch but when you do all that combined together it seems to have a unique effect and you know you go from i i cannot do dips i i just can't do dips right now to okay now i can do dips without pain um so that's something that it's the most bizarre looking thing and do you need to get in competitions with people and try to set the world record in kelly snatch like i did not necessarily although it was fun um but but it's like i was legitimately i i legitimately could not do my pressing workouts for a while if i didn't warm up with it and i still use it in my warm-up so that's something where you know it, like it not being afraid to just try weird stuff you know pays off because you find stuff you wouldn't have found otherwise um that's a theme yeah. of of experimentation that theme of experimentation is so big here. And I think it relates back to what we were talking about Mm -hmm. in the beginning. Like how do you account for that, that piece of your work you need to do things that very well might not be productive or quote unquote Mm -hmm. optimal because you might find something that's relevant to you or even that's globally true. There's this, there's this story I heard a long time ago. I don't even know if it's true, but it was something like populations of bees all follow like very specific paths to, you know, whatever the most, um, you know, whatever fields of flowers are like the most uh, productive or beneficial to them. But there's something like 5% of bees that are just rogues and they go out and do whatever shit. And as a biologist, you're like, well, what purpose does that serve? That's like a waste of resources and so on, Mm -hmm. except that's literally how you find other patches and, and, and so on. So I, I find that really interesting because even with regular trainees, there has to be this line where you like know what your bread and butter is but you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over, but you also can't just go off the rails and do something different every single time you go in. So having that mode of experimentation or that right dosage seems like a very powerful, a powerful part of a training plan. Yeah. I mean, because that's the other component of it. You have to be willing, you have to be willing to experiment, devote devote a certain amount of time to experimentation, knowing it might not go anywhere, but you also have to be looking at it, assessing, seeing, Hey, is this really getting me anywhere? Not just like, Oh, I like doing this. Not not that there's anything wrong with just doing something fun, but you do also have to be assessing it in some way to see like what, what, uh, what it's doing for you. I mean, as far as like the way I, the way I kind of see the whole fitness industry, I feel like, you know, there, 
uh, I mean, a lot of what I'm doing is just looking back at old stuff. Sometimes I just try to develop new things of my own, but a lot of times I'm just looking back at the old practices. I feel like back back in the day before, like before before lifting became as popular as it is, like I guess well, you say maybe in the '70s or so. I feel like it was it was more of a hardcore niche thing, but the people that were into it got deeper. You know, not everyone was into it, but people that were into it got deeper, experimented more, had more variety. Uh, and just you know it, it was just more complex it was it was just kind of like a more complex um then i mean I'm not, I'm not saying everyone who lifted back in the day but certainly at the most serious gyms the most serious folks were there was a little bit more complexity back in the day i, I think things got you know very narrowed in as we just kind of got into you know mass communicate what can be transmitted through mass communication and then also just getting more people into the gym so it got kind of dumbed down and what i'm trying to do in a lot of cases is just expand that back out again but i'm not just trying to i'm not just trying to have kind of a historian's perspective where i'm just going to go and do every old thing that anyone did like i'm not trying to be a historical reenactor like because there's a ton of stuff out there that probably didn't work for anyone there were scams back then like eugene sandow's white dumbbell system i think it's a scam some people disagree with me but a lot of people um and funny it's funny every book that i read from um from that era i've got one right here um this one, this one's one of the, one of the absolute best, uh, super strength by Alan Calvert, a barbell manufacturer in the twenties. Um, I mean, almost every book from that era was kind of like making snide remarks about the light dumbbell system, you know, but you know, some people would go in, would just kind of go back and look at it and be like, oh yeah, this, some old time strong man did. And they said, this was good. So it must be good. No, no, it was a scam, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm not trying to do historical reenactment or anything like that. I'm, trying to kind of experiment to find out what was what was good what's useful what's useful to me what could be useful to other people and especially like what fills in holes in modern gym culture because i think i think when it was dumbed down there are some holes there are some things that may be a little bit more advanced may need a little bit more care but that can absolutely do things that most of the kind of mainstream gym culture which is basically just everybody's a power lifter you just squat bench and deadlift and that's what you do um it's kind of left out. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to learn about all these exercises and stuff, but I'm also trying to find out, okay, what's, which ones are best and which, which ones are most useful and especially, you know, most useful in filling in the holes that we have, you know? So that's yes. where things like the Jefferson curl come in. That's one of the things that I, you know, promote the most. And that's something that I think fills in a massive gap in, you know, in modern gyms. I, I, you, you've been a little bit skeptical, but I, but, um, I think when when pushed with responsibility, that is one of the most beneficial uh, and efficacious of the older techniques that definitely needs to be brought back. I am very charitable to the idea of people reinforcing their spine. I wish it's something that I did earlier the right way. It's funny you say that. And I am, I'll cop to this right now. I'm very bitter about my experience going through lifting um, because I had uh, I had a, a coach who was very good in a lot of ways, a coach, a trainer when I was a teenager. Um, but one of the things that he was negligent on was my deadlift setup. And I just thought yanking away was fine. And um, not that that's the same thing. I know Jefferson curl is completely different, but um, that led to a lack of reinforcement, a lack of acknowledgement of my weaknesses. Those weakness persists. I end up pulling heavier and heavier and heavier, just hang on my erectors. I get my first injury when I'm like 17. And then I got a dozen plus over the next 10 years that mm -hmm. sidelined my strongman career. Funny story is I saw you doing Jefferson curls not that long ago. And I'm like, you know what? It's time I uh, go, you know, go back to addressing my low back hygiene. I got to start doing some bracing work again. So at the end of one of my deadlift sessions, I take an empty bar and I start doing the Jefferson curls. And then sure enough, with the empty bar, I'm limping around for the next three or four days. But that's entirely because of my pre-existing issues and all of that. Um, and also, I recognize that I'm probably not representative of the norm, given whatever injury I got as early as I was. And the fact that I re-injured it so many times while still trying to compete as a, as a competitive strongman. But And I don't know if I heard it from you. I, th I heard it first from, I think, Paul Mauser, the term glass back. And it triggered me so much because <laughs> on the one hand, I'm like, you don't know what it's like. But then on the other hand, I'm like, uh, my ego is like, dude, my low back is made of glass. And every time I've tried to engage with it as a back problem, I found I've made it worse. Me specifically, when I engaged with it as a front problem and got my midsection embracing better and my hinging better, 
it seemed to be okay. And again, is that a gold standard for everybody lifting or is that me in my particular circumstances? Who the hell knows? Yeah. Well, so, so you, you got like, so it was, a uh, we're, we're talking like you feel that pop and you, um, you can't walk the next day. It's so they, they've all been subtly different. I've had the same type a few different times, but I've had some that I'm pretty sure were, were disc related. I've had some that I'm pretty sure were soft tissue related yeah. where, where the pop was actually like connective tissue or muscle or something. And I've had them where it's like, it hurts like shit, but if I make myself stretch and I make myself move, it's better within a couple of days. Uh, I did another one stiff leg deadlifting 405. It was the first rep. And it was one of those things where it's just a freak thing, but, um, it wasn't bad. It wasn't. And I'm like, Oh, I'll be fine in a few days. But even now, a couple of weeks later, it's like rolling around in bed in the middle of the night is a pain in the ass. Um, yeah. but then I've, I've had bad ones where six weeks in, it's hard to get off the couch. It's hard to get off the floor. Like it's, it's, I, it's ran the gamut. Yeah. I've honestly had a ton, believe it or not. Uh, I've, I've had a ton of back injuries. My first one, um, like I'd always heard the advice, lift with your legs, not your back. I, I never had really had anyone teach me how to do it. I, but you know, you just hear that growing up. And uh. so I, I thought I was, that was what I was supposed to do. So I was on the leg press machine of all things. And, you know, trying to, I knew my legs were important. So I was trying to train my legs and I was and I'm not supposed to lift with my back. So I'm doing the leg press and sure enough, I get that pop and you know, I thought I was crippled for life. Right. I, I, you know, that's what you, that's what you hear. You, uh -huh. your, your back goes out and you're done. So I, I let that linger for like a year without doing anything about it. And you just caught, you know, constant back pain and stuff. And I mean, eventually it's just like, you know what, I'm already injured. It can't get any worse. And then I started doing back stuff and then you know, suddenly I've become a lifter and all, but um, I've had tons of some of the dumbest stuff. I mean, I had, I had one doing 75 pound thrusters in CrossFit. I actually had more recently when I started getting into mobility, I had, I got one by just, um, just pulling myself into pancake into a pancake stretch too aggressively. You know, when I first got into mobility, I, I brought the powerlifting mentality and you know, were going to get some metal going. And we're just going to oh, pull myself into a pancake, you know? And then like, I just, the next couple, couple days later, I am literally not getting out of bed because I was stretching too hard. Some dumb shit. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I actually, I actually mildly same, same thing as you I actually mildly, um, straightened my back the first time I tried Jefferson curls. Um, I, cause I was getting into it too aggressively. I was bound, it was with an empty bar. I was getting into it too aggressively bouncing at the bottom and, and stuff. It, it, it wasn't like one of the pops that you can't walk things, but it was a mild strain. Then I started getting into it more conservatively. It's like, you know, real slow, just emphasis on good movement. Um, and just doing that consistently slowly. And I, I built up so carefully, like so cautiously, like I was, I'm, you know, I'm at it. I'm, I'm going from the empty bar to the empty bar plus 2.5s and then the fives, you know, like so on and so on. And eventually it, you know, worked up. So I, I, I just want to set the record straight uh, on what my recommendations are in terms of weights. I recommend like for, for someone who's healthy, you know, a healthy, strong athlete, you might, you might get away with the empty bar if you're careful with it. If you have any kind of back injuries or you're older or whatnot, I recommend like some kind of tiny dumbbell or even just feeling out the movement with your own body weight. Cause it, it's basically a weighted pike stretch. So just see if that feels okay before you start adding weight with my mom, who's, uh, who's what 70 something i had her use a three pound dumbbell when i showed it to her and she did fine with that my dad was kind of an ego lifter so he ended up he ended up going up to the to the bars first time i made him start with the dumbbell but he he ended up going up to the bar anyway and he was fine but um yeah i recommend exceedingly light weights at first and i i want people to get into it real slow give a nice adaptation period before they start loading it like when I, when I train people, I usually make them stick with the empty bar for a while for like at least a couple months until they're make sure their form looks good and everything. And they just had time to adapt because what we're doing, we're not just training muscles here. You know, you add more weight each time. We're also training, you know, like actual tendons and stuff that may, might need a little more time to adapt. I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the science. Some people, there's, there's some, there's some evidence that uh, the spine itself can actually adapt some sort of like bone thing or whatever, like grows or some shit. I, I'm not going to try. We're going like, to say at the level that we can understand it. I, I've never been inside my spine. I have no idea what it's doing to allow me to adapt to this stuff, but some shit in there is adapting, but it, um, it, it takes more time to just, it's not like, you know, a bench press where you just, you, you bench press your first time then you add 10 pounds the next time it's not a good not a good approach with it but yeah i recommend people start super light and just keep it there for a while then gradually you'll start to feel like okay now i can start pushing the weight and then eventually you get to the point where you can be fairly aggressive with it 
Did you I mean, see I, as you as you got into it and as you got stronger, started pushing those numbers? Did you see uh, a change in like frequency of of injuries or strains, or do you, do you feel like it's just there's kind of a certain amount as a lifter you can expect, and it just persisted? Yes, to both. Um, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I I saw it kind of a decrease. The frequency kind of stayed. There's, I would say there was a slight decrease, but I think a lot more of that was just me using good strategy. Because one thing I've learned with all this stuff is like it's it's not what you're doing; it's it's how you're approaching it. You know, if you're if you're coming in with a mentality of like I need this PR to feel okay for the rest of the week, and you're not you're not making sound decisions with your programming, that's when you get hurt. You could be you could get hurt on a, a Jefferson girl. You get hurt on a conventional deadlift. You could get hurt on any any dumb thing you want to if you're if you're bringing the wrong mentality to it. Um, so I, I, I think I, I got more sensible about that sort of thing. So that's probably the biggest issue. What I will say is I didn't get, um, I stopped getting hurt on silly things as much. And when I did get hurt, it was much more mild and much easier. Like it wasn't, it didn't tend to be the whole, you feel that pop and you literally can't get out of bed the next day thing nearly as much. It was more like, Ooh, that didn't feel so good. Let me take it easy for a couple of days and then I'm fine. Uh, I've definitely, I've definitely, um, I've definitely gotten my fair share of injuries since then, but they've typically been less severe. I've been able to work through them. And what I found is even when injured, even when like, I know I'm injured, like my, like the floor level that I sink to is a lot higher. So I can, even if I, I know I'm injured, I can still operate at a much higher level. Like I, I can have like a back in, whereas like I, before I might have a back injury and I'm just like, can't get out of bed. I have a back injury and now I can probably deadlift 225. You know what I mean? If that wow. makes, if that makes any kind of sense. Oh yeah. My, my last tweak. I mean, I, I even, even now, cause I was getting better and then the, I started stretching cause I'm so tight and then I re-aggravated a little bit, mm-hmm. but I'm like, I, I got to keep stretching cause it's, it's horrible. Yeah. But, like just getting off the couch, trying to get my feet underneath me into that squat position to get up. It's like, Oh God. Yeah. So it's like, I know I can, it's not the end of the world but the pain and the seizing and the guarding around the muscles and the hips is like, that's the worst part. It's not even the back. It's like what my psoas starts doing Mm -hmm. in response. Right. But I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that um, the the wisdom that the worst thing you can do is nothing. Like anytime something happens, you got to fucking move around. The more you move, the better, the more you walk, the better. If you can lift the, the, the more you, uh, you start to get back in the swing of things because mm-hmm. if you stay put, man, everything locks up and it just hurts like shit. You, you know what help? I honestly, I think more than more than the spinal flexion because everybody's terrified of spinal flexion and just like wants to. You've got people who are terrified of it and then people who want to embrace it. But what I think actually helped me avoid injuries even more is starting to train spinal extension. Um, I started working over the last summer with uh, with Lucas from Range of Strength. I just got coaching from him on just trying to increase my mobility generally. One of the best decisions I've ever made training wise. But like he had me doing a lot of spinal extension stuff too, um, and that's something that I completely neglected. I mean, I've been doing flexion on my own. You know, I, I worked up to heavy Jefferson curls on my own, and it got to the point where they were just like I wasn't increasing in range at all. I was just lifting more weight. Uh, and, and, like the progress stalled, but anyway, like I wasn't doing any kind of extension, and then I, you know, that that felt different. That felt scary at first, um, but then you know you get used to that extension, and suddenly a lot of things that I think you know would have previously injured me are not in. I'm just completely dodging injuries because of the extension, and then you know I look, I, I noticed that I look back, a ton of the injuries that I've had to my back have had some um, component of being in excess extension that my, that I wasn't prepared for because I had no extension capability capacity like i mentioned the um the time i got hurt doing um 75 pound thrusters in crossfit that's that's the dumbest injury ever how do you you know how do you how does that even happen but what 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 happened and i i remember this i was doing handstand push-ups before that and that i remember feeling my low back was not super happy about that because even that that tiny little level of extension was more than my completely inflexible back could tolerate so that kind of primed me for an injury and you know since since i've become um a lot more extension tolerant that that's that that's helped me sidestep a lot of bad injuries where I think maybe even if I was, I was never getting injured in an extension, but I think just a little bit of it was priming me to get injured. I, I don't know how, I don't know how to like what the mechanism would be. I don't care to talk about that, but it's, it's the truth. And I'm, I'm getting away with a ton of stuff that would be like a, a ton of stuff. Now I, I know for a fact would be just setting me up for injury after injury, but now it's actually a valuable training stimulus. I've been on a pullover kick recently, uh, another kind of underrated movement that 
you know, fell out of practice, in my opinion, because it's a little bit too co- too complex for mass media. It's um, it's deceptively simple. It seems like it's an isolation for your lats, but you gotta you gotta mess with the with your technique, with your setup, with your equipment. There are so many variables that you know that come into play with what should be you know just a simple like almost isolation movement. Like you can see, if you know if you try to get put out, it's not it's not going to be a one size fit, fit all fits all lift. And you can easily, I can easily imagine somebody trying one or two variations and be like, dude, this isn't working at all. I can't feel my lats in this. I'm not doing this. You know, you're just reading about it anyway. Well, that I'm that I'm getting off on a tangent. But anyway, with um with a lot of the variations I've been doing, like I can feel, hey, I would a hundred percent be hurting myself last year. But now this is actually a valuable training stimulus that you know, I'm getting a lot out of. So yeah, the extension I think is um is, is really underrated with the uh, uh um, injury prevention as well. Yeah. It's, it's a, through my, through my journey. I mean, my big problem started having no integrity and I've kind of a longer back relative to my height, at least not in absolute terms, but, uh, no integrity in my midsection and upper back. So just hanging on my spine, mm-hmm. which wasn't great. Cause I wasn't training anything mm-hmm. of substance, but then I started correcting that by overextending. So kind of the same thing mm-hmm. you're talking about where I wouldn't do a deadlift unless I looked like an Olympic lifter. Like I thought, Oh, I don't want my back around. I need to arch as hard as I possibly can. And that got me into a, like the worst yep. of all worlds because yep. one, that's the weakest position in the world to try to move any weight from because abs are flexed abs are stretched open like that's just not mm-hmm. how you're supposed to bear a load it stretches right. your hammies and glutes at the start so starting power sucks so i couldn't deadlift aggressively at all and then i would immediately get pulled out of position anyways because there's no rigidness to it but i had horrible back hygiene from just trying to arch 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 and it's kind of funny because i actually didn't really get my back right until i learned how to soften that and bring my ribs down mm-hmm. and i was so terrified of like having forget flexion. I mean, neutral. I was like, no, 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 it's gotta be arched. And I I, I think you very much can get, um, can get overuse issues in either and get broken down pretty quick. Uh, and I would say that if anybody is going to take their back hygiene, uh, seriously and try to bring themselves back from the brink, it probably is going to be a mix of different protocols to, Mm -hmm. uh, to keep you, you strong and resilient. I want to segue off this because I want to get some of your input, given the fact that uh, you have developed the strength that you have with some of these lifts and you've gotten flexible and, uh, and your experience and you've experimented quite a bit, but you also have kind of that strength background. You've, you've played around powerlifting at strong numbers mm-hmm. at that point. If you were going to make like recommendations to somebody uh, about these lifts, as far as like what you think the most useful ones are the ones that people maybe sleep on or think are uh, think are silly that might actually give the most carryover to kind of general strength or size goals like what would that list look like and then on the other hand i want you to answer uh what are some of the ones you hate or you think are problematic or useless or that you tried it once and you're like that's dumb i'm never doing it again well um i don't want to completely so that's actually going to be one of the main selling points of my book that I'm hoping to get out. Oh, okay. Okay. Next, um, uh, next month, hopefully if I'm, I'm in the final process, but I've still got to get a website and everything so I can sell yeah. it. So I'm not going to completely spoil one of the, one of the, uh, the biggest, uh, I think one of the coolest parts of it is I'm not just describing how to do these lifts. I'm, I actually, I've got to make a tier list format at the end where I'm, I'm structuring it in terms of tiers, like, you know, like the prop, the popular YouTube format where the criteria are, not only is most effective, but what helps fill gaps in modern training the best. So it's the, the title of the book is Old Time Lifts for Modern Lifters. And the theme is not is just kind of describing how to do each one, telling what it's use, useful for and everything. But at the end, I'm trying to explain like which ones fill in gaps that we have um, you know, the best. And you know, we're ranking them in terms of like, you know, we have the ones that are just completely filling holes that modern training doesn't really do the ones that are more effective than something simple that's something that would you know perform the same function in modern training some that have you know unique advantages some that are basically equivalent not better not worse um but you know different so for kind of conjugate purposes it's still variety and then the ones that are subpar there's something there's something better out there probably don't waste your time on this um so i'm not going to completely spoil with the top three because that's i don't want to yeah i don't want to spoil it but I've already mentioned uh, at least I'll say at least one of them. So I think 
I think probably anyone who follows me will know that I think Jefferson curls are incredibly effective. Um, and you know what? I already mentioned pullover. So I think that's, I think that's something that is a big hole in modern training because uh, not only are they good at developing the flats and whatnot, but I mean, they're so good for shoulder mobility. Um, that's something that we're not doing now. We, um, I mean, if you look at this uh, same book, I, I showed you uh, super strength, wonderful read. Um, a, a, a barbell manufacturer back in that time just had a better command of the English language than a lot of, you know, act, actual you know intellectuals these days, unfortunately. But um, if you look at, if you read between the lines, well, read, if you kind of interpret out these, like what he's recommend, what he's recommending, he's, he's having, he's wanting like new lifters just starting out to be doing light Jefferson curls and pullovers. So you're, you're making sure that you build your shoulder mobility, your, you know, your ability to get overhead and all that good stuff. You're building your ability to flex and be you know comfortable in a rounded back position and all that. I mean, how many injuries could be avoided if people were, if that was your foundation, you know, cause no, I mean, no one's these days, no one starts out trying to train their, um, you know, their overhead mobility. Um, I mean, at best, they're doing pull-ups. Hopefully, they're doing, you know, dead hang pull-ups so they actually get a little bit of hanging benefit, but nobody's trying to actually train that that position. So then, you know, a ton of us end up just, you know, we're just trying to push weight overhead. We may not even be able to externally rotate enough to actually get in that position. So lo and behold, our shoulders start hurting, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, I've, I've had a, my shoulders have been um, an issue because of that in the past. Um, hopefully, I'm kind of pulling out of that, but I mean, you know, so many, so many issues I think could be avoided if we, you know, were, if we had that kind of foundation, we were doing those movements, but, you know, they've been abandoned because it's harder to, you know, you, there's a little bit more complexity to it. You can't just say, hey, man, just, hey, just go do a Jefferson curl. Hey, just go do pullovers. If you do that, the people that you tell, hey, just go do Jefferson curls, you don't add a ton of, uh, a ton of like caveats and, hey, this is how you're going to progress. This is what the form looks like. Is it? I mean, coaching people on the Jefferson Curl, there's a ton of mistakes people make. I'm not like bashing, but it's something that has to be. It's, it's something that has to be, you know, coached fairly well, or you have to just be very attentive yourself and, to make sure that you're doing it right. And it help, you know, hopefully video yourself so you can see what you're actually doing. It, it requires some attention. Like I said, with the pullovers, just getting back into them, I think it's tremendously valuable. But it's not a one size fits all thing. You're going to probably different people are going to prefer different implements, different different methods of execution, um, uh, you know, a variety of different setups, and, you know, you're going to have to play around with it. So, um, you yeah, know, but, you know, but I think, I do think those were setting up a good foundation. I think that was probably why, you know, you saw all these people just lifting so much weight overhead without ever having the shoulder issues we do today. They, they had a good foundation. Same, same thing with the Jefferson curls. I mean, the, the way they, the way Calvert's teaching it, and I think the way they were doing it is you're going to, strengthen your spine with lightweight in that extreme position first and then move on to deadlifts. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't have the mentality we do now, which is let's try to get beginners doing the lifts that, uh, that they can lift the most weight on immediately so they can feel good. They can, you know, make lots of gains. And I mean, the lifts, like the lifts we start people on out on now, you know, squat and bench, they'll put a lot of, they'll absolutely put a lot of mass on you. They're very valuable lifts, but so, you, I mean, you're going to put a lot, put on a lot of muscle mass, probably faster, honestly, than what they were doing back in the bronze era. But you're also, if that's all you're doing, you're also setting yourself up for the shoulder issues, the back issues that we tend to, you know, end up with. So you have lifters at the five-year mark who have definitely put on a ton of muscle, but are now getting, you know, sidelined by all these issues, right? Um, so those those are those those are definitely in the top. There may be there may be some more that are you know extremely valuable. Um, you know, in, in terms of in terms of just strongman performance, I think the bit press is something that's untapped. I mean, that's that's a resource that you know. Well, I mean, it, it's all it solves a problem that nothing is really solving right now to that same degree. I mean, I know you want to check up on Saxon's numbers, but there were there are a number of there are a number of documented guys who got at least three hundred overhead, I've... and most of them were normal size. They weren't like four hundred pound giants. So if you have something that's letting you know more than that's letting a lot of guys get three hundred pounds overhead with one hand, that's I mean that that's um that's kind of uh, it's it's showing advantage over what anyone is doing today in that sense. Um, and I think they, they got a lot of you know, developmental benefit out of it as well. I mean, just, it's, it's a really great, you know, lat developer, the way your lats engage doing that, obviously shoulders and whatnot. Um, so that, that's, um, just kind of more on the strength and performance side. 
you know, it's just you're able to do something folks aren't doing today. Um, let's, let's get into, um, I'll, I'll spoil one, one that I consider kind of mid Jefferson deadlifts. That's a, that's a deadlift where the bar is between your legs. I mean, it's got some advantages. It's, um, I mean, you're, you're training yourself in a, in a, uh, a, you know, so there's a little bit of rotation involved. It's asymmetrical. So, you know, you're arguably preparing yourself for something different, but I would say it's not really, it's not better than the conventional deadlift in any way, but it is different. So, and I've had tons of times where like I've tried to warm up for one type of deadlift. Maybe I wanted to do a uh, conventional that day. It didn't feel so good. And then I end up trying another variation like Jefferson or hack the behind the back deadlift. And, you know, just randomly the other one feels really good. So I can, you know, it's good to have different tools in your toolbox. So even if just, just that little difference um, in stress points uh, can be all, all that you need to um, uh, just go from not being able to have a good session on, you know, heavy pulls to suddenly I'm getting a rep PR, you know, it, it's crazy how often it works. And it's not always the same one. Like one is more back friendly. No, it's like just depending on what, what you've been stressing too much, any, any one of them could work. That doesn't mean that, but, you know, the Jefferson's not, it's not better than the conventional deadlift. I would say it's worse because it doesn't carry over to as many things. There's just a ton of things that require lifting a bar in front of you or, or a load or whatever. But, you know, it, it's a good alternative. And there will definitely be times when the conventional doesn't feel so good. The Jefferson does. And you can get a lot of good work out of it. That's kind of a mid-tier. One that I kind of hate personally is the one-hand jerk. So back in the day, they used to have um, the, the, I mean, they used to have the one hand versions of the Olympic lifts in mm-hmm. um, the Olympics, the one hand clean and jerk and the one hand snatch from the Olympics. Very cool. I would have liked to watch it. Um, but man, I hate one hand jerks. <laughs> I like the one hand cleans. I've, I've got up to 225 on the one hand cleans. That That's a fun lift. But the jerk is just so awkward. It's just so limited. Unless unless you can do. Um, did you see Logan Aldridge pull off the uh, his 225 one hand clean and jerk? No. He's an adaptive athlete in okay. CrossFit, which means he's uh, only got one arm. I don't know why. But anyway, yeah, he was able to pull off a one-hand clean and jerk. Oh. But his way of doing it, um, he, he uses basically a conventional overhand grip. So he's he's cleaning it and then catching it in this, you know, in this position, mm-hmm. which would snap my wrist in half. I would die. I, I do what most of the old timers do, which is a reverse grip. And you, I, I like to catch it kind of on my shoulder to the side. Um, but when you do that... Now you gotta you gotta get a secure rack position to launch it overhead, and that's if you have the wrong limb length, it's damn near impossible. Like I can I can clean two twenty five to the shoulder, or at least I did it once. I regularly I can clean two hundred to the shoulder. I I can't I can't jerk like I don't think I can jerk more, more than like one hundred or something because you just you you dip and drive and it's just like a spring. You're just like yeah, you know, unless you can figure out how to lock it in, and some people can. Um, but that's just so challenging and all the same training benefits you could get with like a circus dumbbell, you know, something big where you have something, you have a way to actually secure to your shoulder so you can actually drive with it and then lock it out overhead. So like one hand jerks to me, unless you happen, unless you're so flexible, you can actually do the conventional rack or you just happen to be um, um, well set up for it. That doesn't work especially well. Um, it's, yeah, that that doesn't work <laughs> at all. So that, that's what I kind of hate. Um, let's see. Was there anything more to that question? Uh, well, if uh, any ones you would rank it at the bottom as uh, things that should have died off uh, through selection, but still persist. Well, definitely, there are some there are some ideas from that period that sh- that need to die. Um, one of, one of my biggest pet peeves. This is this is a um, a silver era issue that started in the silver era, which is the idea that this is more, this is less strength, more bodybuilding, but it's the idea that you need to selectively underdevelop certain muscle groups in order to present the illusion of size. This is the dumbest idea oh. I have ever heard of. It's idiotic. It's so stupid. It still persists. There's, there's people that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No I, I talk to people. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, it, it started in the silver era. Um, as far as I can tell, I mean, the first, honestly, the first, I hate to say it because it's going to piss people off, but the first person who came up with this idea or not came, I don't know that he came up with it. I I've never found that he came up with it, but the first person that I've heard preaching this idea was Steve Reeves. 
who is an idol to a lot of people. But yeah, the idea is you're supposed to not develop your traps. You're supposed to have small traps so that your shoulders look wider because apparently if you have big traps, your shoulders look narrow and you're not supposed to develop your obliques or anything or even do too much ab work or even do heavy squats or whatever because that's going to make your midsection too big. So that's going to interfere with your V taper and you're going to, you know, and then you're not supposed to, um, you're not supposed to do squats because it'll make your glutes too big and that's not aesthetic. So you're supposed to just, um, you're supposed to do all these silly, not, not silly, but you're supposed to just like selectively not develop certain areas. And Vince Gerond is like the worst guy about this. And I mean, I'll probably get some heat for this, but I, I can't, well, no, he, he had some, he had some good ideas, but um, very, guy irritates the hell out of me. And if you look at it, if you look at pictures of, of him, uh, he, he looks, he looks kind of good in the sixties, right after Diana ball was invented, but he looked, I mean, he looked like a skinny little twerp um, in the fifties before Diana ball was invented. So um, yeah. Any, but anyway, like, like he looks like a pencil neck because he wouldn't develop his traps, you know, good, good V taper because he developed his slats, but you know, the guy should have, I, I feel like the guy should have lifted and you know, he never won any competitions back then because his competitors were actually lifting. But anyway, it looks, it's just, it's such a dumb idea. I mean, it, Steve Reeves pulls it off because he just had, you know, the widest shoulder to hip ratio that anyone's ever seen, but that's his bone structure. You know, that's not, that's not his training. And if he, if he'd done a whole bunch of both leak and trap work, he would have still had wide shoulders. You know, like you look at someone like, um, um, Serge Nubre, he had kind of the same build with a, with super wide shoulders and, um, you know, a narrow waist and he's got massive traps and he still has wide shoulders. Like, it's not like they make his shoulders look any less wide. So it was silly. I, th I think one of the big reasons why Arnold actually was so successful is he didn't listen to that nonsense. He, he developed big traps and, you know, he, he, he wasn't quite as narrow in the waist as some of the other guys, but you know, when it turned, when he turned to the side and you know, he was three dimensional and they were very, very narrow. Um, you know, it's just, I, I came across a guy uh, the other day who just shows how silly this idea is. He, he just looks frankly ridiculous because he, he does have kind of a wide waist anyway. But you can tell he's trying to do this. No traps. Uh, anyway, it's it's um bottom line. If you have a wide waist, you have a wide waist. Like that, that's me. I have a wide waist. I'm not going to look like Steve Reeves, no matter how little I develop my obliques. All I can do is try to look like the Farney's Hercules or Eugene Sandow or something. There, you can't you can't modify your bone structure. You have the bone structure you do, and being underdeveloped is, is going to fix it. You know, just maximize your muscular development, no matter no matter what your bone structure is, and you'll just look better. I mean, guys, we. You know, guys with bigger traps look more, you know, imposing. Whether well, you know, don't 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 um, if you have narrow shoulders, don't uh, amplify the problem by also having small traps, right? Yeah, you don't have the uh, luxury of hitting the brakes, all right? It's it's almost yeah. it's almost that mindset of like uh, girls when they're like, I don't want to lift weights, I don't want to get too big or something like that. It's like you don't you don't have the luxury of being able to hit the yeah. brakes on anything and still expect good results, especially if that's leading you to not do really, really, really productive things because you have this superstition about something else. And it's, it's funny because like we talked about the light dumbbell system and I, I, I spent a week going through the entire run of lifting from the Victorian strongman era up through, you know, modern bodybuilding when I did one of my videos from a month or so ago. And I came across, it seemed, it seemed multiple people had light resistance systems because mailing things was cheaper than exactly. actually and nobody had gym. So it's like, if you're going to reach a lot of people, that's how you do it. It's the equivalent of buy mm -hmm. my program, but you have the light dumbbell system and you have this era with a lot of things that are good and quality. I was really surprised to see how far back foundational principles go things that I thought in, as far as I knew, it's like, well, that's from Weeder's list. Like Weeder invented it. You know, I hadn't yeah. tracked the history, but that's your first thought of it. And it's like, Oh, this was a hundred years before people understood mm -hmm heavyweights, regular practice, right? These feats of strength are what develop these, uh, these physiques and then progressive overload. But then on the other hand, you do have a lot of the shit that sticks around and using, going back to an era or looking at any piece of culture and trying to use that as a template, it just, it, it still cuts back to that question. It's like, okay, how do you pull the things that are useful? How do you know, how do you troubleshoot when something sucks? I, in researching found the forums where people are, you know, falling for the allure of the old time strongman affectation and guys are super excited to report the progress they got running through Sandow's five pound dumbbell system. So, yeah. you know, it's like they romanticize it because, Oh, it came from the system. If it happened far away a long time ago, then there's some, exactly. there's some magical thing, but 
yeah, it, it makes sense. I wouldn't be surprised if people stumble across that old wisdom and think like, I don't know, there's still people that think glutes aren't manly. I have people in the comments on my glute video that are like, why yeah. are guys trying to grow glutes? That's that's some chicks. It, it's, it's really bizarre, the superstition that comes across as far as like what's effective, what your goals should be and how it relates to the, to the culture you're in. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to definitely get away from. It's just the, you know, the, uh, just anything from that era was good. Anything, anything from, I mean, n- not at all, not at all, but at the same time, like recognizing that definitely some people, um, in, in that era had figured out things that, were highly advanced and, you know, led to capabilities that we do not have today. Um, well, I, that, I would, I would say that at any rate. I mean, we saw recently, um, what's the big Russian fellow's name? Um, I, I'd pronounce, I, I'd, uh, I'd mispronounce it anyway. If I, if I attempt, if I tried to pronounce it, uh, big Russian guy, uh, Olympic, Olympic, ex Olympic lifter. I think he may have done some strong man too. attempted the, um, the one hand snatch from the, to, to beat uh Rigolo's record. Um, I think he, he tried to do, I think two was 254 pounds. Couldn't quite make, came very close, but couldn't quite make it. So, I mean, if you have, you know, small, not small, but if you have fairly moderately sized natural guys putting up these kind of, these kind of poundages and, you know, some of the stuff was in front of accredited judges with weight weights and stuff. They had some understandings of some things, not necessarily all of them, but certain, certain among them had understandings of things that I, I think we, aren't fully getting back to, although we're, we're getting a lot closer. One of the cool, one of the cool things that I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm actually getting pictures to illustrate my book and I'm, I'm trying to use all modern lifters because I'm not just trying to put the past on a pedestal and just, um, you know, go back and worship all the past guys, all, all the respect to them. But I want this to be for modern people to use and, you know, maximize their potential. And I'm just, I'm, I'm getting a lot of really cool people, you know, I'm, I'm getting pictures of a lot of really cool people doing, you know, very impressive lifts that are in a lot of cases very close to what a lot of the best of the best at that time were doing, or even better in some cases. Um, like I, a very impressive young man, uh, Joey Keeley, recently pulled uh, 550 one handed to full lockout and then six plates, uh, like 585, um, very, all, very close to lockout. So I'm, yeah, I've got a picture of that. That's so cool. You know, like we, you know, when I, when I first read about this stuff, it was just inconceivable. Um, but now we've got, we've got people that are starting to, you know, chase some of those numbers and get to them. Uh, we're not quite there on some of the more advanced, like skill-based lifts, like, you know, the bent press, no one's, no one's coming close to the old numbers, but um, yeah, I think that, I think that's coming because more, more capable people are, are um, getting into this stuff and more, um, people are just kind of develop, developing the capabilities as they go, like me getting into mobility. I, I, I still don't have the mobility to really do the bit press. Well, I kind of half acid, you know, but um, I'm working on that. A lot of other people are, and we're, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing people get into the two hundreds now. So I think at some point we will start seeing people get into the three hundreds again um, as we kind of, you know, relearn what they were what they do at that time, you know, and a, a lot of people are just black billed because they, you know, all oh, those guys have like testosterone 10 times ours just because of like microplastics or whatever. Okay. Never mind that like the Saxon trio didn't eat meat. They only ate meat. I think one day a, a week because of you know poverty growing up, but yeah, they all had 10 times our testosterone levels, but uh, yeah, I think we're, we're relearning a lot of that stuff and um, mastering the best of it. But even, even then, like a lot of, you know what i I, this would have been a better answer to your question. Like, what do I not like? There was a ton of stuff back then that honestly like mirrors, mirrors um, some of, some of the, you know, bizarre lifting now, uh, just, you know, random setups that were designed to allow you to just lift the absolute most weight possible, you know, with some kind of harness or um, even big platforms, you know, they, they put multiple horses on a platform, have you lift it. I mean, some of that stuff was cool. You know, Gorner would actually wrestle with an elephant. It was a small elephant, but he would have an elephant like with its legs on his shoulders, and he, I mean, you know, it was a small elephant, but it was still an elephant. You know, every elephant's pretty big. That was cool, but um, but some of the stuff was silly, and some of it actually just had you know was set up to allow you to uh, appear to be lifting a lot more weight than you were, and a lot of it was just exploiting the fact that people back then, you know, you didn't have leg press machines. So nobody realized that everybody and their mom can leg press a thousand pounds. So if somebody lifted like, you know, 10 live humans, people thought that that meant something. And in some cases it did. I mean, you had some of the real ones who were demonstrating strength through shorter ranges of motion, like Gorner. I mean, 
I think he I think he did a short range leg press with like four thousand pounds worth of people, but he's demonstrating his strength in so many other real ways that we can tell. I mean, this guy this guy managed to put four kettlebells overhead weighing a total of four hundred and thirty pounds. So, you know, <laughs> I don't think just that anybody could probably leg press you know, four four thousand pounds worth of people, but um, yeah, there, there there was a lot of um, there were a lot of ways to just lift the most weight possible uh, that weren't necessarily that developmentally beneficial. That being said, I think there's absolutely a lot a lot of been there's absolutely a lot of benefit to like short range partials uh, done done to develop tendon strength. Um, like I think that that's why the power rack was invented in the first place to was to facilitate like short range partials for like the deadlift and squat and just for Olympic lifters. I know the, uh, the guys at York, like John Grimmick and all them, they would, um, they actually had a chain set up at York barbell so they could, they could put uh, barbells overhead and just do overhead lockouts. And I, I guess John, John Grimmick and some of the stronger guys would work up to like 800 to a thousand pounds on overhead lockouts, which is pretty impressive, but it's also, it also kind of explains just how, how much enormous tendon strength they had back at the time. So I think there's been, there's a lot of benefit to some of that stuff. Um, if done for, for that particular, uh, training objective, but you know, it shouldn't be seen necessarily as as much of a feat of strength. Like, Oh, wow, this guy lifted a thousand pounds more. Just like, let me do that. Maybe, let me do this like once a month to develop tendon strength. And I think that will, that's got a lot of benefit, but we should see it more as, um, you know, something that is developmental, a little goes a long way, not necessarily, oh, wow, I did a short range partial. Everybody look at me. That's, you know, I get a lot of heat for, um, for example, my power shrugs. I like to do really, really heavy power shrugs. And I, I think it's just the best trap exercise I found and people hate it, but like it works. My traps got bigger. I don't, I don't show off with it. I mean, it's not a, I don't do it to show off. It's not like if I'm going to show off, I'm going to show off something cooler. You know, I've got a bunch of stuff I can show off with. That's just a really good way to, to put a lot of mass on your tracks. It just, it just works. But um, yeah, I think I think some of the heavier short range stuff needs to just be seen as like there is a developmental purpose for this. But let's make sure that's what we're doing and that we're not just 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 picking the lifts to let us use the most weight for the hell of it, you know. Every time the somebody realizes that they can move a thousand pounds an inch. It happens in strongman all the time. You do enough yoke walks. Eventually you're like, well, what's the heaviest I can pick? And there's people that prescribe it in training. And then you realize, especially when you train it regularly, your potential to lift weight is insane relative. Like it doesn't even make sense relative to uh, a full range. It's easy to go off the rails. And I wonder about the utility of the, of the partial stuff, because on the one hand, I've, I've done it enough in the past. I've done overhead supports were like, kind of a vogue training accessory for a while uh, leading into peaks for like a log press or something mm -hmm. like, like you would do, you know, the heavy overhead support and then you would go do your log work or axle work or whatever. But long-term I, I haven't come across anybody that married them. I know guys like, I remember Steve used to was like trying to pick up the edge of like a dump truck, like a quarter of an inch, you know, overloading himself with as much as possible. And you talk about kicking concrete walls for tendon strength and silly stuff. So I know guys that were like all in on that stuff, but I've never come across somebody that married it effectively. Um, and, and that's it's something I've thought about revisiting um, if, if for no other reason than just to be able to get work in through short ranges of motion when tendons hurt and the full range sucks or whatever, uh, because there is benefit, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like so neurological. It's not going to slap an ounce of muscle on you. You know, yeah. you could do heavy yoke walks every day of your life, and the, 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 you might you might get a thicker midsection or upper back, but but that's it's pretty limited. And I think that's where people run into trouble is thinking it's a it's a hidden secret when whatever utility mm -hmm. it has is 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 hidden at best. I love mean, the the way the old school the old timers at least in the silver era thought about it, which I think I mean. I don't have any studies to back this up, obviously, but we've talked about that. Um, I mean, their, their thought was less that it was going to put on muscle and more that it was going to potentiate muscle. So you do the, um, you know, you, you do some of the heavy support, some of the heavy partials to build the tendon strength, and that's going to give you just better architecture for the full range movement. So, you know, you'll be able to lift more, potentially more weight, you know, for more reps in the full range movements. And therefore you can put on extra muscle mass that way. And I mean, I think, um, it makes sense to me conceptually because I, I do think a lot of 
the the kind of limits that our body would naturally put on us if we're talking about naturals. I, I do think a lot of the limitations to how much muscle you can put on are structural. Like your body's not going to give you an amount that would likely cause you to rip your muscle off the tendon. I think I think that's one of the reasons why enhanced guys have to be a little bit more careful is because you're you're kind of voiding the warranty, so to speak. You're putting a big turbocharger on your engine that may not have been designed for it. And it's a lot easier to rip your muscles off the tendon. I think <clears throat> so I mean it would it would stand a reason that if you can if you can find a way to strengthen that you know, that, that connective tissue, your, your body might be more amenable to allowing additional muscle growth. Now that's not the only way to, make, to build tendon strength. Obviously the stretching, the, the extreme, um, you know, extreme range of motion, the other extreme is also beneficial and, you know, you can help make your tendons more healthy through getting a pump and all that good stuff. But you know, the, I think the argument, the best argument would be, it's not going to necessarily build muscle, but it might help you build it in the future. If you can just strengthen that architecture enough, if that, or, or at the very least, you know, prevent injury down, down the road so that you're just not getting sidelined by injury and you just build more muscle through consistency. So I think that would be the argument for it, but, it, yeah. but that would be something where it's like a little goes a long way, you know, the way I, the way I've always done them, if I'm, if I'm going to incorporate heavy partials, it's going to be like you, I mean, depending on the, um, depending on the exercise, but usually like once a month, it's not going to be in every, in every session thing because you're going to need more time to recover from that. Um, like once a month or maybe even less in some cases, it's definitely kind of an, a little goes a long way type thing. Even with lifts that are more just like, I guess, structurally dependent, like one hand deadlifts. I don't, I'm not going to do those every week. That would not work out at all. I need more time than that to recover. So if I'm, you know, training one hand deadlifts, I'm either doing it once every three weeks or in some cases I'll, I'll just do one hand per week. So I'm, I'm giving, you know, longer recovery times with anything, anything kind of, you know, heavy overloads for the tendons. I think just, a little goes a long way. It's definitely a good, a good, um, a good way of looking at it. That being said, I mean, I think I, I do credit some of some of the um, some of the strength I have to that because I, I have used that I have used that method, and I think that may be a little bit of what separates me from some of the people that are more just doing the long range stuff but don't have quite the um, don't have quite the power. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, who, who knows? It's, it's not a controlled experiment. It's just my experience, but. I, just, you know, just from doing stuff like trying out the bench press lockouts and then seeing my bench go up, I, I think there's something to it, but it, it can definitely be overstated. If, I, if you're, if you're gravitating towards too much of that, just because you like seeing the big numbers, that's not going to help you at all. Well, let everybody know where or, or about when they can expect uh, this book to be done and where they can expect to find it and then let them know where they can find you. Well, primarily on Instagram, that's where you can find me. I'm, I'm starting to make a little bit of a push on YouTube, maybe more once the book gets out and I have some free time. Uh, Atlas Power Shrugged on Instagram and also YouTube. Um, where, as to where to find the book, I'll announce it on Instagram. Um, I still have to make the website. That's actually the most uh, daunting part <laughs> uh, of this whole thing is trying to come up with a website. That, that's going to be fun, but yeah. Uh, old time lifts for modern lifters is the uh, going title unless I come up with something cooler between now and then. I'm hoping to get it out by the end of February and most of the writing's done. A lot of it's just adding pictures, adding hyperlinks to videos, and then yeah, coming out with a website. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we're looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Atlas power shrugged for coming on. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you. All right. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. This has been an awesome conversation. Yes.